I want you to all welcome Dr. Richard Bandler. You all know him. He is the uh, creative genius and co-creator of NLP. And Dr. Bandler, we are very excited to have you here. I hope you can see as well. Yes, I can see you. Um, Thank you it's, so much. it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, we are a, actually a very big group. We are 131 today in the call, and we are really, really excited. As you have heard, we are a mix of students, um, students that are um, from the Mind Valley hypnotherapy, but there's also NLP practitioners that from the July course uh, that you gave in Orlando. So it's a it's a mix of students here and. We're very excited that you're here. Uh, well, it's it's nice to be here. Juan didn't give me a lot of details about who I was talking to. He just asked me if I would do it Saturday morning, and I have the day off, so. Um, very good. I got so, up, fed my dogs, and turned on to Zoom. <laughs> well, that is. I, I have no preparation because I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> Well, I know you will do really good. He mentioned that, well, he told us that you guys have, uh, you have a new book called Legacy of the Master. Uh, yeah, uh, we, Juan and I have been working on this. He recorded me and asked me a lot of questions and uh, we've formatted it. Uh, Garner Thompson, who wrote The Secrets of Being Happy with me, uh, has just finished editing the book. And so it'll be going to press pretty soon. Uh, I thought it was going to be a larger book, but it's actually only about 100 pages. But it, it literally goes through and talks about how I think about getting clients better. Uh, that, you know, I don't like to use the term fixing or repairing because I don't think about it that way. Uh, to me, that when people come in and over my over 50 years of seeing clients, almost every single one of them has been given up on by just about everybody. Uh, I, on purpose, took all the worst case scenarios because I thought it would teach me the most about developing new material. Uh, in the beginning, I had a cadre of psychiatrists and literally I, I would sit down with them and go, what's difficult? And, you know, they, you know, you know, they, they, one of the first things they told me was phobias. They said, Phobics are impossible because you can't even talk about the subject without them freaking out. And uh, so I, they each sent me somebody with a different phobia. And I began to explore ways of going about making it so that they could not only talk about it, but think about it and ultimately overcome it. Uh, to me, the same machines that because you're only born with two natural fears, loud noises and falling. And so all the rest are learned. And if you can learn to be terrified, uh, you can learn to do something else. Uh, to me, it's all about re-education. And it's re-education at the neurological level, not so much at the psychological level. I, I believe that you know the history of psychology put too much emphasis on content and getting people to, quote, understand what's wrong with them uh, and as far as I can tell, most people understand pretty well what's wrong with them, uh, and it doesn't really help them. And if they figure out where it started, it really only reinforces them. Reliving trauma just makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. Uh, the notion that insight produces change, that if you understand a problem, you'll go, aha, and magically it will disappear. So you discover you fell in a river when you were four, and now you're afraid of, of water, uh, it doesn't really help people to be able to swim. So Juan said people were going to ask me questions. Who's yes. who, who, yes, who yes, are these people and what are these questions? <laughs> Ooh, we have very good questions for you. But um, the, the first one he told us is that if you could explain us about the rules of thumb. Well, to me, my rules of thumb are really pretty easy, that when clients come in, uh, my job is to figure out how their problem works and that I don't look at difficulties as, as, as being something that doesn't work. Neurologically, it works that, you know, somebody who has panic attacks in public 
uh, does it every time. They don't forget and do it on and do it on Wednesdays, but not on Thursdays. They have a machine that works. And if I understand how it works and if I understand it, and this is a big rule of thumb, if you can make it worse, you can make it better. And so when I understand where the pictures are, how big they are, where the voices are, what direction they're going, which direction their feelings are spinning, typically I can take control of the process and make it so that it's worse. And once you learn to make it worse, of course, you can reverse the process and make it better. It tells me what to do. And uh, the rules of thumb that I use as guides for my behavior are I have to understand it enough that I can make it worse because therefore I can make a decision about whether or not I can use the same machine to do something else or if the same machine is doing something useful. Uh, somebody went to a unlicensed neurolinguistic programmer. I know you people keep saying that you have a master trainer coming when Juan comes. You have a licensed master trainer. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there calling themselves trainers and master trainers that have no training and uh, beware of them. Their certificate will say on it, licensed trainer, licensed master trainer, and will have my signature in ink on it. Uh, I've specifically done this for 50 years because it's very hard to control when everybody in the world has a printer. And people have gone to the length of printing certificates that look like mine. That's why we now put a watermark on them and, uh, and, and duplicating my signature and sticking it on so that they can call themselves a trainer. And if they went to that amount of effort, you'd think they'd go to the effort to learn the skills because I get a lot of their students and they have no idea what they're doing. We have people sign up for our courses and go, oh, yes, you know, I'm a I'm a master practitioner. And we ask them three questions and they can't answer them. And they're simple questions, you know, that if somebody comes in and goes, I'm depressed and we go, what do you do? And they go about what? And then you go, what difference does it make what they're depressed about? I mean, you know, that is a deletion you're challenging, but it's not useful because it doesn't give you any information to help them. Uh, whether they're depressed about, you know, the world affairs or depressed about their relationship with their wife, they're still never in, do, engaging in the activity of depressing themselves. So we want to know how they know that because we start with the biggest chunk and work to the smallest chunk. And the rule of thumb is gather as much information as, cast, as you can, as quickly as you can, and to determine how the machine works and what it works for. This person that went to the other neurolinguistic programmer uh, came in and they were an artist and it, it, they, they got over their anxiety, but they couldn't paint anymore. And they said every time they'd look at a blank canvas, they just go, so what? And so they learned to be more relaxed, but they lost all their motivation. So you have to be careful about deconstructing machines. You have to separate what the machine works for and what it doesn't, and because it's all an opinion. You know, anxiety may motivate you, but it, it, that's not the only way you could be motivated. But if it's how you motivate yourself, you don't just take it away because it makes it so they're more comfortable in groups. Uh, you make it so they're comfortable in groups and they're more and they're more apt to paint. Uh, that if you're not careful about the whole ecology of the thing. It means that you don't understand the system. And, you know, we're not in a business to make people worse. Good Lord, there's no shortage of stupid people on planet Earth. This is why this is a great profession. You will never run out of clients. And, you know, when people say, you know, I can't find somebody to practice with, you're not listening because people are constantly complaining. And they're complaining about everything because a lot of people... But their idea is that the world should change so that they can feel better. The new nickname of this is called triggering. And when I hear people talking about, oh, this triggers me, we have to make sure nobody ever does it again. Uh, you know, that, you know, that's just ludicrous. You know, you're supposed to take control of your neurology. That's what getting smarter is. Getting smarter is that you determine what motivates you. You determine when you're going to make good decisions. Not that if the fact that somebody uses a certain word, you become uncontrollably uh, unhappy. 
And, you know, that now there are all these words that you can't say and things you can't do and things you can't wear. Uh, oddly enough, my grandson, oldest grandson, is a senior in college. And he told me, he said, the hardest thing about college is knowing that you can't talk about things in front of other people. That, you know, that there are just all kinds of things. He grew up in Texas and, you know, and he's going to college in Boston and it's so liberal. There are like all these things that you can't talk about anymore. And, you know, it's ridiculous. If you say if you say the word Trump, everybody goes into a tizzy and has to go into a safe room in college and recover. When you're in college, you should be learning how to cope with the world, not how to be not how to be at its mercy. And so I'm a big fan of a challenging the idea that people are triggered. Of course, they're triggered. Our job is to make it so that they're triggered in a way that's useful so that they learn to stand up for themselves. When I was a kid, sticks and stones could break your bones, but words can't hurt you. And now it's every word can hurt you. Let's find a new word to be hurt by. It's ludicrous. Uh, to me, the, the work I do with clients is to give them more freedom. And that's how I think about it. So when I find out how to make something worse and therefore how to make it better, I make a decision about whether or not they're going they're they're going to get better by having a separate programs for separate activities, or whether or not uh, I'm going to turn the machine on itself and build something new. Uh, and that depends upon whether or not there's people are representing the world accurately to start with. Because a lot of people are not. They're not seeing and hearing what's actually going on. So therefore, they're not they're not mapping the territory very well. The machine inside your head is supposed to map the territory of your life so that you you're better able to cope with it. the brain. The nervous system is designed to make things familiar so that you can act repetitively so that when you see a new chair, you know what it is. You don't have to figure it out. You know what it is and what it does. And as close as it approximates other chairs that you've seen, you know what to do with it. Well, as human behavior and, and activity gets more and more complex, then this is the point where, you know, people tell me they're offended by what somebody put on their Facebook. And I said, then don't go look at it. And they go, they go, I have to. And I go, oh, no freedom. OK. And to me, if you don't have freedom of choice, you know, because you could look at the same posting and think that person's just a, an idiot. You have a lot of choices about how to respond. And when people don't have choices, they don't have freedom. Uh, it has to be on to 52 years ago. Uh, I asked Virginia Satir, who was one of my mentors, I said, I said, how do you view your job? And she said, well, most of the people that come to me don't have a choice. So therefore, they don't make one. If you only have one option, there is no choice that people need to have several options. And she believed people would make the best one. And in my career, as soon as people have a better choice, they typically use it. No, thank you for the rule of thumb. Rule of thumb. That's good. So I'm going to ask Cam to come to the spotlight and ask her question. There you are, Cam. Okay. Good morning. Thank you Good for morning. being here. I nice look to see you. Yeah, I look, I'll see you in just less than two weeks. So I'm very excited for that. Oh, that, yeah. That's... Yeah. Um, so the question for you is, what is the strategy you use with anorexics and bulimics? People well, it, it depends. They're not all the same. But most of the time, I find that, uh, especially with uh, anorexics, that the only way they feel in control is not eating. And they think they're in control. And no matter how people try to help them, uh, I was told this whole big story about uh, body dysphoria. And they look in the mirror and see themselves being fat. I didn't find any of it to be true. I had five or six psychiatrists bring me bulimics that were literally and a couple of them I had to go to the hospital because they were so underweight they were literally get, feeding them intravenously it was terrible they were skin and bones and you know and I literally held up a mirror and I go do you look fat and they went no and I, and literally said things like 
I know I'm killing myself, but I can't stop. And, you know, and when I said to them, I, I said, I said, you know, I said, so you're out of control. And they said, they looked at me and they said, no, I feel perfectly in control. I can turn my hunger off. And no matter what they try, even if they try to feed me a grape, I don't look at it and go, I'm hungry because they don't associate the their illness and they don't associate what they're seeing in the mirror with the activity of eating. And I always look at them and start laughing and going, you're completely out of control. I said, the only people who are in control are the ones that have an off button and an on button. Because if you don't have an off button and an on button, you're not in control. And I said, if you could build an, a thing in your mind, which I typically do hypnotically, I put them into trance and I make it so they can be really hungry or not hungry, that they can eat a certain amount and turn it off so that they, they are actually in control. The illusion that, you know, if your life is out of control and everything creates anxiety and literally with most bulimics and, you know, which are not as bad as, as anorexics because they binge, they go out of control and eat too much and then go through a regret period where they don't eat, you know, but and then, you know, the cycle keeps going over and over again. And the fact that they regurgitate the food is not really a very good solution because to start with, it ruins their teeth. I can identify a bulimic from a mile away by their teeth. You know, I've had doctors bring in a person and just turn around and looked at them and said, so, you, so you're bulimic. And, they, and, you know, some of them came in for other problems and just, you know, you get that blush, you know, where the unconscious fills their face with red and, the, the doctor looked at, and he, and, at me and he goes, no, she's not bulimic, she's depressed. And I went, no, she's bulimic, you know. And I look at the client and go, just admit it, you know. You can tell by the teeth, now, you know, all that stomach acid melts the, the enamel off of them. And they start to have a certain tinge of color to them. And they smell a certain way. That when I studied Chinese medicine, the good Chinese medical doctors detect illness not only by doing Chinese pulses, but by smell and by your fingernails. And, you know, I discovered a lot of things like when I had schizophrenics come in very often, they had some kind of metal poisoning. They weren't schizophrenic. They were poisoned. And when I'd see that they had, you know, a, a, a copper tinge to their fingernails. I'd send them out and get blood tests and, you know, you'd find out some of them had low potassium. Some of them had an iron overdose. I had one that had lead poisoning, lived next to the freeway back when they used to put lead in the gasoline and it got into the ground and they were growing tomatoes in their backyard and eating the tomatoes and making spaghetti. And they, they had wild hallucinations and had been hospitalized 13, 14 times and nobody had done a blood test. And so the more you can see and the more you can detect, the more you can save yourself time. But with bulimics, you have to, again, do the same thing. You have to catch it before it starts. You have to give them the thing that goes, look, you're out of control because you don't have an on-off button. Your off button is to vomit out what you should have not eaten, right? Which means you're making the decision at the wrong time. That's like deciding you should have put a condom on after you have sex. It's just the wrong time to make the decision. It's stupid. It's, you know, it's not pathological. It's stupid. And until you can get people to identify that what they're doing is stupid and laugh about it, that's what sets them free. Because the endorphins in the brain allow us to grow new cortical pathways. And that's why, you know, the people that see me work, they go, why are you getting your clients to laugh all the time? I'm filling them with endorphins because the oxytocin that is released when we have endorphins, that, that, that neurotransmitter allows us to repattern and build new cortical pathways. Because basically their cortical pathway is going along, be it ever so microscopic, and then going in a loop. And it's not, it doesn't have an OR gate. It doesn't have two choices of where it can go, let alone five choices. And, you know, if the choice you're making is, should I eat too much of this or too much of that or too much of this, right? You're, you're making the wrong choice. Uh, you know, you have to get the neurology to know that they could have a glass of water and feel satisfied. 
And sometimes we have to train people to do that hypnotically. They just don't know how. They've never done it in their whole life. They don't know how. When they start to feel anxiety of any kind, they go, what would make me feel better? And the first thing that pops into their mind is food. Right. And, you know, they call it comfort eating, but it's actually stupidity. It's not comfort eating because they eat and they don't get comfortable. They get uncomfortable and they throw it up. So it's a stupid name for it, you know, and and the trouble with diagnosis is we name things and then we start believing the names. And, you know, it, you know, when you say somebody is depressed as opposed to they're depressing themselves, it relieves the responsibility to take action. And then, you know, that when with my clients, I get them to, to turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. And I go, if you do this, will it make it worse? And they go, yes. And then they look at me and they go, but I don't want it to be worse. And I go, well, then you shouldn't be doing this because it's, you're, I'm giving you instructions to do what you're doing anyway. And you do this every day. You know, you get up and, you know, the only thing you don't have is a schedule for it. Uh I actually had a compulsive once that had a schedule. He, you know, he was a compulsive shopper and he he would get up in the morning and go to work. And on the way into his office, he would buy two shirts because there was a shirt store downstairs. And then as he left his office, he would buy two more shirts. And when I saw him, I, he was back east and I didn't have an office. So he, he, I said, can I just come over to your house? And he said, there isn't room. And I went, I beg your pardon? So I went over to his house, and when you went in the front door, the living room was floor-to-ceiling shirts in the package. They hadn't been opened. They weren't even all his size. Every day, two shirts going in, two shirts going out. If he went out to lunch, four shirts, you know, and he would buy two, two. And if he went out to lunch, he'd buy two going in and two going out. And he rather than donate them to the Goodwill or something, his entire house, four bedroom house, floor to ceiling, all you could do is walk into the house and go into the bedroom and sleep. You go into the bathroom and clean up, barely, and you couldn't even get in the kitchen. He'd have to pick food up on the way home. So it was something else to buy. Uh, you know, and this was his entire life for like 25 years. He'd been going to a psychiatrist who was asking him, how do you feel about your mother? And, you know, and he had all these psychiatric tales and psychoanalytic tales because he was in New York. Most everybody in New York has a psychoanalyst. I think it's a matter of pride with New Yorkers. Because <laughs> every time I go into town, I, I see clients day and night. And most of them come for bragging rights. They don't come because they have problems. Uh, to me, the thing with both bulimics and anorexics and almost everybody else is catching it before it starts and giving it an on-off button, putting them in trance and making it so they could either be hungry, they could either be thirsty. Most of the time, I convert most of the the comfort eating into thirst, so that and I make it so they take a, drink a half a glass of water and feel more satisfied than they've ever felt in their life. One of the powers of hypnosis is that you can amplify feelings and you can give post-hypnotic suggestions, which is a great combination. We're going to be doing a lot of that when you show up in Texas. We're going to do a lot of deep diving. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you. And I have the next person, Deborah, I'm going to spotlight you and I'll remove this one. Go ahead, Deborah, you can unmute speak good morning dr bandler how are you today i'm pretty good it's wonderful to see you first i want to thank you for working with me in the, my with my spider phobia in july it has changed my life look i'm even wearing spiders on my ears now <laughs> <laughs> yeah i get that sort of thing a lot you know I'm I'm sure you do. People I'm are sure terrified with snakes and then they end up owning one named Bob. <laughs> Th this, this is the first thing I got when I left the, the practitioner's class. <laughs> so, so thank you for changing my life. Um, so I, um, I read uh, uh, the table of contents for your new book and I noticed, I saw that in a couple of chapters, you mentioned brain plasticity 
um, which made me think of a woman that came to me for help. She said that she had diminished cognitive functioning after having a bout with COVID, that she struggles with uh, the inability to focus and complete simple and complex tasks like creating a family meal um, or handling the family um, finances, you know, doing running the checkbook. So my question, and what happens then is she, this all results in, in severe frustration and anger and depression and the cycle just continues circles around. So my question is, uh, what is the strategy that would be used to help this person regain cognitive functioning and the ability to focus on both simple and complex, ta complex tasks. Okay, well, th the first thing I would do is, uh, I, I wouldn't be convinced that there was brain damage. Uh, to start well, I, with, that, I typically enough, show, that typically shows up in an MRI. A well, bad bout with she, COVID can, can lead to stupid decisions. Right, because if while you have COVID, you're having trouble doing something because you're not thinking properly, because that's a very strong illness. I had it twice, but you know, it 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 it, it doesn't necessarily mean, mean it's brain damage. the The shots that they give people apparently give you problems with your heart, but not your brain. Uh, you know, although some people have had strokes. And if she's suffered some kind of a stroke, it should show up in an MRI. This is why I prefer to work with a medical doctor so I can get the tests I want. Luckily now I'm married to one, so it's easy to get tests. Uh, that simplifies the entire task. But uh, that that to me, I would I would test to find out if there's physical damage. You know, get her go to her medical doctor, you know, or whoever's telling her that this is a result of COVID and get an MRI, especially if she has health insurance, because it's there are expensive. And, and and she did. She did have a, a cognitive testing done. And oddly oh, enough. No, 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 no. I didn't say cognitive testing. Okay. That's a psychological thing. Right. That's where they they ask you whether you can memorize a bunch of fucking words and stuff. Uh, according to that, you know, I'm a, I'm a simple idiot, you know, I, I have problems with cognitive functioning, but it, and see, I've just completed my 35th book, so I don't believe them, right? Testing is done with machines and scans. It is not done by psychologists. Psychologists set up these centers because they're money machines, right? They, you go in and they're used by lawyers to prove that, you know, you, you can't, you know, you're not responsible for whatever behavior you did. Uh, they, you know, they're used by psychologists to justify getting payments from insurance companies. And, you know, they're like little factories. I had to do it for a legal case one time. And I went in and, you know, they, they had one, one psychologist, PhD psychologist, and 12 assistants administering the test, each in a separate room, for 20 minutes at a cost of 2,500 bucks. You know, it was, a, it was a money factory. But when psychologists do testing, they're not doing testing. They're, 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 they're running a bunch of tests and drawing conclusions from them to justify behavior, not to improve it. And so take that stuff with a grain of salt. You know, if you get, an, if you get a scan and there's something wrong with your brain, it shows up. You know, if you had a stroke of some kind and, you know, there's some kind of damage, I doubt you're going to find it. I think what happened is you just developed bad habits and the anxiety went into a loop. And to me, what I would do would be, you know, when she thinks about one of these tasks, right, when she starts, is she motivated or is she anxious, right? At what point does the anxiety start? Because that's what you want to know. So, you know, you go into and you pick the thing that she didn't finish the most, most recently, and you start at the beginning, you know, you knew you had to do your checkbook, right? So did you go, oh boy, I'm going to get this done? Or did you go, oh shit, I'm never going to finish it? And, and find out sequentially what she does in what order to find out where she gets off track and then put her back on track. Because when you used to do it, you know, you know, as you, you know, the way you complete tasks is becoming more motivated the closer you get to the end. 
And if she's going into frustration there, you know, and saying, I'm having trouble focusing. Well, that's that's right. She is having trouble focusing. That's an activity that's not a result of some psychological bullshit. That's what you're doing. When when people tell me I'm depressed, I ask them how they're depressing themselves because I want them to own it. I want them to know they're doing it. I want them to be able to turn it on and turn it off. Everything needs an on off button. She's not she she's not engaging in the activity where she would be focused to the end of a task, even a simply fa simple family meal. Right. She should make a plan of what she's going to do and make sure as she goes through the steps, every step leads to the next step. You know, you, you chop the vegetables, you fill the thing, you heat up the water, you put the steaming thing in, you put the vegetables in, you know how long they're going to cook, and then you take them out. Okay. If in the middle of that, she's, she's you know, walking outside and vacuuming, then she's not sticking to the plan. And if you make it feel better, every step she gets through three things, it will kick off by itself and start doing everything. It takes one or two three it is a good number uh sometimes i use five with the particularly stupid but she doesn't sound particularly stupid she sounds like somebody that got off track when she was ill and i don't think this is a psychological problem i don't really think it probably requires an mri i'm just thorough uh, you know but it sounds like the the illness caught her off guard threw her for a loop and she just did you know she had trouble focusing then and she hasn't gone back to who she was. So I would use a little age regression. I'd age regress her mind back to when she could focus, and I'd leave her brain that way and have, bring her back to the present age. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that detailed description. Thank you so much. You bet. <laughs> Anyway, you, by the way, you did not see the table of contents of the book. You oh. you saw the list of things that 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 are in the book, but not necessarily in that order. That the table of contents is now being written because the book is done. There are two things about writing books that most of the people that come to me who are having trouble make the same mistake. The first one is they write the introduction before they write the book. And you can't introduce something that you don't know what it is, right? So you write the book, then you write the introduction, right? And then you write the table of contents because wow. now you know what's in the book. So well, the list is a fascinating you, list. Yeah, well, it's a list of the stuff that's in the book, but not necessarily in that order. Uh, that you know, we videotaped a lot of what's in the book, so when the ebook comes out. You know, and it, there there are four hypnotic inductions where I do treatments with people about different things. And when you're reading the book about something else and it says you need to do this thing, you can actually jump in to the video of the transcript and see how you set up finger signals. Mm -hmm. But it may not be for the purpose of bulimia. But, you know, since you're using a lot of the same techniques, I wanted the people to be able to be reminded. And the, the real book will have cue codes that you can and go so that if you're reading along and there's something that you just don't know how to do or you want to see it done, you can actually go and take a look at it. Uh -uh. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Bandler. And I had a final question about a strategy. What, what would be your strategy for helping clients with suicidal tendencies? With what? Suicidal tendencies, like what, what's a what's what is a recital tendency? <laughs> suicidal tendency, like they want to commit suicide in their lives. Oh, su suicide. Suicidal, yes. Yeah. Suicide. Oh, suicide. Yeah. Okay. Suicide. Yes. Suicide. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it, you 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 either commit suicide or you don't. And, you know, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem, and the worst case is when you get teenagers. Because teenagers think they know everything about life and they're 14 years old. They don't even suspect anything about life. Uh, the last one I had, it was 14 years old and, you know, and he, you know, had an actual suicide attempt, didn't do a very good job, took a bunch of pills and ended up getting his stomach bumped. 
And uh, I actually saw him on a Zoom call and I said, you know, you know, how could you do anything this stupid? You're not old enough to know what life has to offer. You know, when I was 14 years old, I had no idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life. You have no idea what opportunities are out there and the people you'll meet and the things that will happen. You, you know, you might have missed out on a, a you know, you make a, a, a quick decision based on what you know, but you don't make a decision on what you don't know. And uh, I, I asked him, I said, you know, what, and he said, well, he said, I live in a small town. He goes, I'm not good in school, right? He goes, I don't get good grades, so I'm probably not going to go to college. And in this town, he said, the only jobs that are really available means I'm going to end up working in a fast food restaurant for the rest of my life. And I said to him, I said, does the town have walls? And he went, walls? And I said, yeah, walls. Is there walls around the town? Or, you know, is it like a prison or something? I said, because by the time you're 18, you're probably going to want to leave the town, you know. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to do that. Some people join the military, you know. I said, and by the way, when I was 14 years old in school, I was considered, I was actually taken out of college prep and put in machine shop because they told me I had no academic I have five PhDs, for heaven's sakes. They were wrong. You know, I said, you know, you're trusting the judgment of high school teachers, right? And going, they must be right about me, so I'm going to kill myself because, you know, I'm not good at calculus. You know, something you may or may never use in your life. Being smart means you make good decisions. And by the way, trying to kill yourself wasn't a very good one. You need to learn to make better decisions and start reading about the rest of the world, right? I said, go online and see what else is out there. You know, you have no idea. You could be, you could become an electrician's apprentice and end up very wealthy, you know, owning a beach house in Malibu. And when you're in Malibu, you could meet this wonderful woman and have a marriage and have kids and have a wonderful life. And you're going, oh, I'm 14 years old. I know fucking everything. And until you can get them to look at what they did as stupid, they're going to repeat it. And the trouble with most psychologists is they take it so seriously, they get people to be serious about their suicide attempts or their suicidal thoughts. And really, you want people to become phobic of them. You know, this is a good thing to do with all the old phobias that are left over. So instead of being terrified of spiders, you get the woman, so she's wearing spider earrings, and you take that fear and give it to somebody that needs it. I might do something really stupid, kill myself and miss out on the best life ever. You know, excuse me, Bill Gates didn't graduate from college. He did pretty well. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I do like this, uh, being able to use the machine, right? The phobia machine. Give phobia, give phobia to the... <laughs> Well, if you know how phobias work, you can give somebody one. I used to give junkies phobias and needles. <laughs> <laughs> and depositories and pills. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, first I just did needles and then they started using suppositories, you know. Le leave it to a junkie to be creative. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> well, thank you. And 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 we are we they told us three questions so we got our three questions in but before uh, you go we you know as cam mentioned we have the dallas event that uh, some of us are going and so we will see you there in person but i um i would like it if you could explain to the rest of the group that might not have heard about this event if this is something that could interest them or or not so just let us know a little bit what is happening there well <clears throat> Most of the seminars I teach are about becoming a practitioner, or I do a hypnosis seminar and teach people about doing hypnosis. This is a little bit more advanced in the sense that I'm, I'm <clears throat> sort of assuming that people know the meta model. I'm assuming they know the Milton model and that they have a, at least a small background in hypnosis. I don't care if they're a practitioner or a master practitioner, but all these people doing coaching out there and all these people a lot of them doing NLP don't really know how to approach clients and fix them. They don't know the difference between, you know, the map is the territory and, and territorizing, 
knowing how to go outside of the map that's there and build a machine that maps more territory. Uh, they don't know how to make decisions with clients uh, about making things worse or making them better. And so we're, we're going to use a lot of hypnotic techniques and a lot of different techniques, and I'm going to demonstrate a lot. Uh, normally, I co-teach with people. Uh, John and Kathleen are going to be there, and they're going to do some evening catch-up things for people that aren't good at things. But uh, the day, all day, is going to be me for four days straight. And I want to do it now because I'm getting older, while I still can, and get some people out there to do a good job. A lot of my trainers are actually signed up for it. Uh, so there'll be people that are master trainers coming to the course and people that have done very little, but they do some coaching or some hypnosis. And and that's good. We call those people demo subjects. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> well, thank you. And it will be in Dallas. People are asking, where is this? Yeah, it's, 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 in, it's actually not in Dallas. It's in North Dallas. Uh, it, it's, it's not very far from the airport. It's not near the airport, but it's about 25, 30 minutes from the airport. And it's in a, a town called Plano, which is North Dallas and North of Dallas. Uh, there's, there are all these little cities, Addison, you know, every, you know, if you go to Chicago, you go North, there are cities, you know, you go to Washington, DC, you go North, there are cities. In fact, in Washington, DC, you end up in another state, but Texas, that's not going to happen for a long time. Texas is very big. And this is, it's in a relatively new hotel. It's a beautiful place. They have lovely food. We're feeding people lunch and dinner one, one day. And, uh, and it's on a street that's got probably 30 restaurants on it. And it was built as a single complex. It's called uh, Legacy West. And on the other side of the freeway, there's a place called the Shops at Legacy, where there are another 30 restaurants and shops and jewelry stores. And so it's a really nice area for people. I do seminars there. Typically, I do the personal change workshop there. And, you know, it gives people a chance to go outside and walk around and try different kinds of food. Right next to the hotel, there's a, 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 a you know, there are Mexican restaurants and vegetarian restaurants and, you know, sushi restaurants and everything you can think of and all kinds of little interesting shops and stuff. So it's it's kind of a fun place and uh, it, it's very nice. It's a relatively new. It's all been built in the past 10 years. Uh, most of the things in Plano, I moved here a long time ago and it was, you know, fields and now it's all stores and shops and office buildings and uh, almost every corporation has moved to texas because we don't have any taxes mm -hmm. so fedex moved here you know a lot of big companies have moved here and but it you know it's it's a it's a good it's a good place to do seminars because you know people you know they really don't need a car they can uber to the hotel and they, you know you can uber around if you want to go somewhere further away, uh, but mostly you can walk to everywhere you need to go. And so, so it's so, nice. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. And spending four days with you and learning from you is going to be, you know, what actually we're looking forward to as well. And people are asking two things. When will your new book be available? And do you know, do you have a date for that or... Well, we're trying to get it out fast. And, uh, you know, that uh, it, this is the point at which it's not really up to me. I've done my work. Yeah. Uh, you know, the editor has done his work. So it's going to have a lot more to do with Amazon than anybody else because they kind of fight you tooth and nail. You know, you send it in and they come back and they go, the letters are too far apart. You know, <laughs> they, they whine about absolutely everything. But, you know, we were hoping it would be available by the time the seminar starts, but I can't guarantee that because it's out of my control. Some things are in my control and some things you just have to wait for. Mm -hmm. So, but it will be very close. I I received uh, the final edit on the manuscript uh, two days ago, went through it, found a couple of grammatical errors and corrected them. Uh, the table of contents is coming, I think, tomorrow. And, uh, and and Juan will probably send it off to Amazon beginning of next week, and we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, the cover is done. Everything is ready. So uh, it shouldn't be long. 
That's great. That's great. Uh, the ebook e may take a while because I, yeah. you know I just don't know, but but I know the the actual book will is probably within the next couple of weeks. I would think. That's great, and it's it's like a so you know you you'll be explaining your strategies for different conditions and well, then uh, videos yeah, as well. I, it's I I call it the reeducation. You know, oh. there, there's the re-education of bulimics, the re-education of you know, people with anxiety disorders, the re-education of phobics, the re-education of different things. And, you know, and then uh, uh, <coughs> so there are four rather large, one of them's a rather large transcript and the other three are pretty long too. Transcripts where I bring somebody up on a stage and go through the whole process from doing the hypnotic induction that people are always asking me for scripts and I don't really use scripts, but I wanted them to have something to base to figure out, you know, you know, how you get people into trance. So every time I put them, somebody into trance in a different way and, and set up finger signals in a different way and use different hypnotic techniques. One of them I do pseudo orientation in time, uh, which is where you project people to the future where they're already succeeded at whatever it is and then ask them how they did it. <laughs> and then bring them back to the present so that they know they have a plan. And uh, one of them, you know, does the age regression. And so all of these deep hypnotic phenomenon, you know, there are examples of using them to re-educate somebody. And, you know, there's a part where I amplify good feelings and diminish bad feelings. And all of the patterns that are in my other books get used in some fashion inside these transcripts. And when you go through the part that's uh, telling you, uh, you know, about working with the people who grind their teeth or something, that actually there's a, a thing that you can cue code where you can jump and look at that little thing out of one of the transcripts. Very good. So like with the QR code, you can access a video or? Video, yeah. Everything video. Wow, okay. that's in the book was video. Wow, okay, great. Very good, very good. Excellent. Although, yeah. <laughs> although it is edited in the book, so they took out some of the swearing and some of that stuff, but it'll probably be in the video. <laughs> the video will be a little more X-rated than the book. Okay, that's good to know. And they want to, everybody wants to know, you're coming back to Florida next year? Is that? Yeah, this will be year 26. Wow, okay. Uh, the, the only year we missed was COVID. And uh, we even did half of that year, you know, because COVID started in the middle of the year. But yeah, uh, we've, we've been doing it in the same hotel. We stay in the same hotel rooms. Everything is the same except the group itself because every class is a little bit different. And, uh, you know, a lot of people redo the practitioner several times because there's a lot of material. It's not just the content. It's the way the content is applied. And of course, I demonstrate out of the audience different things, depending upon what people put in the box. You know, I have a box on the stage and people put in things, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I know what's in the room just because I've done this so often. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I go down a list and mention things and somebody lights up like a light bulb in the audience that kind of gives it away. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun. It's a, it's a fun course. We typically do the prac and the master prac at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily in the same room all the time, but uh, you know, it, it, you know, they're just different content materials. One is more about strategies, and one is more about techniques. And practitioners learn techniques to solve problems. And to me, it's all about problem solving. And that's what the meta model is: is a problem solving machine. And if you think of it that way, then, you know, it works better. That's why I rewrote The Structure of Magic um, and wrote a book called Problem Solving because it, it, originally it was my thesis in college and it was a book about how therapists use language. Unfortunately, therapists don't use language to solve problems. And we found out the meta model itself as we designed it uh, was used, you could use to solve any problem. It didn't have to be therapeutic in nature. Um, it's used by advanced systems plannings at big corporations, 
It's used by military intelligence. It's used by police departments, used by everybody. Um, last 50 years, my work has spread into all kinds of places uh, that I would have never suspected when I started. That's why I didn't kill myself when my book was rejected originally. I, you know, sent the structure of magic to six, seven publishers. And one of the big publishers, the one that had done Milton's book, uh, the senior editor wrote back and said that, you know, that, that therapists wouldn't find it helpful. Therapists wouldn't like it. And obviously I didn't understand Gregory Bateson's work and Gregory Bateson ended up writing the introduction to the book. That's great. That's great. Well, everybody's super excited. They all the questions that I'm getting are about when are you coming to the UK? <laughs> when are you coming to? Well, uh, I lost my promoter in the UK, and uh, <laughs> uh, right now I'm trying to find another one. And uh, I went and did an evening uh, with uh, an organization, and they did a really good job. So we're we're considering coming back maybe next year. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. And, and, you know, we here in Mind Valley, we do a lot of a Zoom and virtual events. Like, is that something that is in the future for you? Like vir virtual events, I'm really asking just because people well, are... I don't know. Nobody from Mind Valley has called me. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm a hired gun. You know, I don't put these seminars on in Florida. John and Kathleen do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I used to put on seminars when I was younger, but I got to the point where that's just not the part of the business I want to be involved in. I want to go teach. Mm -hmm. You know, Wait, I, so teach, I teach, I write books, I see clients, I do consulting. Um, you know, uh, uh, that's what I'm good at. And, you know, being a seminar promoter, I did a pretty good job of it for years. But I gave all that to John Lavelle and other people and let them do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just takes up too much of my time. Yeah. Somebody from Mind Valley calls me, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. Okay. Uh, and would you... Right now, Paul McKenna's doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, he, I think he's got 2,000 or something signed up this time. Uh, that's that, you know, but. Uh, well, that, so I'm hearing that you would be open to virtual events. So. Well, I'll... yeah. I mean, if somebody made the right <laughs> proposal, again, you know. I mean, Paul's in England, so, you know, for him to go and do video, if I had to fly over there once a month, I don't know if I would be up for that. But, uh, you know, if we could go in and 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 do something or if I could do it from here, uh, I'd be more than happy to do something like that. Uh, I, You know, I don't even know who runs the company. I just hear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It's a big rumor to me. But, yeah. <laughs> Somebody out there wants to contact me, you get a hold of Kathleen Laval at purenlp.com. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always the easiest way to make contact with me. They set up all my work and my schedule and all that stuff. Excellent. Well, someone here, please go and talk to Vision <laughs> and let him know that Dr. Bandler, that would be so awesome. And if not, if Vision doesn't do it, you guys know that I will, maybe I can, okay, maybe I can do this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I'm going to get on with my day. Um, thank you so much for being here. We, I have we, dogs that want to be walked and they're looking thank at you. me anxiously. Yeah, you guys can come off mute and say thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.